Spiders. Terrifying creatures ruling the world of creepy crawlies with an iron fist, mercilessly stomping everything in their path. Or at least, that's what we're conditioned to believe. There is oh so much to the world of spiders that goes completely under public radar. So let's fix that. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. After almost 20 videos on various insect orders, I thought it was about time to throw in a video on the second group of that little mission statement. So today, we're talking about the order Araneae, more commonly known as the spiders. Araneae literally means spider in Latin, so let's just get that explanation out of the way early. As mentioned, these are not insects. They're arachnids. They got eight legs. I'll do a separate video down the line on how to spot the differences between insects and arachnids, but for now, let's talk about what makes a spider a spider. As said, spiders are arachnids, so you should notice those eight legs right off the bat. They also have two body segments. As opposed to insects, which have a head, thorax, and abdomen, spiders have an abdomen and a cephalothorax, a fusion of the head and thorax. You'll also sometimes hear this referred to as the opisthosoma and prosoma, respectively. Focusing in on that cephalothorax, spiders will normally have a multitude of simple, not compound, eyes. They'll also have a pair of pedipalps by their jaws, small leg-looking appendages used to manipulate prey. Side note, these fanged jaws are called chelicerae, in case you want to sound fancy. Another unique trait is at the back of the abdomen, the spinnerets, small projections used to manipulate and spin silk. They don't have antennae, and they don't have wings either, much to the relief of the arachnophobes. Spiders don't go through metamorphosis, but we can still describe their life cycle in three stages. Egg, spiderling, and adult. Spiders are pretty good parents. A female spider will create large silken cases which can contain hundreds or sometimes thousands of eggs. She may hide this case away, hang it safely in her web, or in the case of the wolf spider, carry it around with her. After a few weeks, out hatch little baby spiderlings. Spiderlings just look like tiny spiders, so that part's pretty easy. Sometimes, parental care can continue even after the hatch. The spiderlings may hang out in the mother's web, like this green lynx spider. They may cling on to the mother's back, such as this wolf spider. Or in one extreme case, the jumping spider Toxius magnus produces a milk-like substance for its young. This milk actually has quadruple the protein of cow's milk, so I'm keeping that in mind next bulking season. When it's time to disperse, some spiderlings will just scurry away on their own, off to start their own life. Others do things the fun way. Many spiderlings will participate in a behavior called ballooning. This is where the spiders raise their abdomens into the air and shoot out little silken threads. When the wind hits these threads, the spiders are sent airborne dispersing them to a new location where they won't have to compete with their siblings. These spiders can be sent hundreds of miles, and ballooning spiderlings have been found multiple miles off the ground, five kilometers high for our non-American listeners. Once settled, spiderlings will feed and grow, molting up to ten times before reaching maturity. There's no fancy pupil stage, they just shed their carapace one day and boom, they're an adult. As you probably know, spiders are predators. They catch and subdue prey through web building, the art of ambush, or they just hunt freely. Notable strategies include precision lassoing, offensive camouflage, that one hippie jumping spider who eats plant-based, and horrifying trapdoors that make me glad to be a human. Spiders cannot process solid food, so they inject their prey with enzymes to digest their victims' insides into a yummy liquid they can slurp up. Though they're often portrayed as just vicious predators, spiders can be prey as well. Birds, rodents, frogs, reptiles, wasps, and more will happily gobble up a tasty spider. There are whole groups of wasps that are spider specialists, such as the famous tarantula hawk wasp, which paralyzes tarantulas and injects its eggs into the immobilized host for the larvae to feed freely. 
Spider defensive strategies often involve hiding and some sort of camouflage, either mimicking their environment or another arthropod, though some may turn to biting when desperate. Many tarantulas have their own little unique strategy where they flick urticating hairs, barbed bristles that irritate the skin of a would-be predator. If they manage to survive the birds and the wasps, they can take a shot at mating. Everyone always talks about how female spiders eat the males. And yes, this is a legitimate concern for the male. Males are often smaller than the females, and producing eggs is not cheap. So a female is not likely to pass up a free meal. It's an eat first, ask questions later kind of gig. So spiders often have courtship rituals, which establish the relationship prior to entering striking range. This can involve tapping a rhythmic pattern on the female's web, an ornate dance, or gently tapping the female's body to let her know what's up. Don't worry, the weird part hasn't even started yet. The male creates a silken case in which it injects sperm from its abdomen. It then uses palpal bulbs on its pedipalps to soak up the sperm, acting as a holding tank. If the female is receptive, it will use these palpal bulbs to inject sperm into the female's abdomen for fertilization. And then sometimes the male gets eaten anyway. But hey, that's more energy for the female to use to produce more progeny. Honestly, if I was a spider, I'd probably have arachnophobia. But as a human, we don't have a ton to worry about. Spiders are very shy, and most bites are incidental, an act of desperation for a trapped spider unable to retreat. The vast majority of spider bites are non-threatening, and there are an estimated less than three deaths annually in the United States. Some species do have some nasty bites, such as black widows and brown recluse, and if you are bitten by a spider, still keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't get infected. If you have whole body pain or lingering pain, medical attention could be necessary. If you are bit, it also helps to get a picture of the spider for more specific treatment. But overall, spiders get a way worse rep than they deserve. Even Australia has only had one spider bite related death over the last couple decades. Spiders have a whole host of benefits associated with them too. Spiders are generalists, and while they may eat a pollinator from time to time, spiders around the garden can help keep a whole host of agricultural pests in check. They've got all their levels covered. Wolf spiders can patrol the ground, jumping spiders can guard the foliage, and the orb weavers can handle the airborne insects. Alternatively, spiders can be food for other organisms. Dr. Ashley Kennedy did her entire dissertation focusing on bird diet composition. Birds need a lot of insects to provision their young, and it turns out spiders are not safe either. Most of the data focused on eastern bluebirds, and Dr. Kennedy found that spiders made up 15 to 20% of these bluebird diet comps. That's almost a fifth. We may get some additional use out of them, as we're starting to learn how to manufacture spider silk, which is incredibly strong, flexible, and biodegradable. So that would be cool. Like many arthropod groups, and many species in general, the main threat facing spiders is habitat loss and degradation. Having multiple layers of native plants on your property can be a great way to boost spider diversity. The native plants bring in the insects as prey, and the multiple levels can cater to different spider groups. Flowers for the crab spiders, foliage for the jumping spiders, stems and branches as web supports, and some ground cover plants for the wolf spiders to run around in. Pollution and chemical sprays can also negatively affect them, so try to only spray when really necessary. And now that you've had a chance to learn more about them, if you come across one in your home, hopefully you take it outside rather than breaking out the sandal. Thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future orders. And if you have any favorite species of spider or any fun spider facts I didn't cover, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear about them. Peace, everyone.